Hello and welcome once again to Crazy Comics and Stories. It's me, your charming and delightful old Uncle Rap Bastard. And at the other end of the series of tubes and wires that we call the internets is Joe, Crazy Writer. How you doing today, Joe? Um, I'm doing okay, I guess. How about you? I'm half awake. Oh? I was up late last night covering the AEW Revolution pay-per-view, which AEW, I will AEW. talk about later. Ooh. In both freaking and geeking. Come on. Get, well, now wait a minute now, because this is our previews episode. And if it goes two hours, we might not have time to talk about freaking and geeking. We might have to we might have to wait till next week. Uh, uh, I but, suppose. Just like the Partridge family. Come on, get happy. I mean, I know I've got a copy of uh, Foo Fur number one from... Uh, Marvel Star Comics for my retro comic, but we got to wait because uh, previews takes precedence. And Foofer, believe it or not, was an animated series. I know. I picked it up for a buck, and then I'm like, well, it was that or the uh, KFC Double Down. And I thought, well, and again, I will I will talk next week on freaking as to why I would not. I am probably not going to try the Double Down even if it's for our uh, show. By the way, the Double Down was the first American food we did. Yeah, I don't know. It, it's kind of our spiritual father in that it's food, food that probably only Americans would eat. Yeah, yeah, or even think of making. It is oh. two breaded chicken patties as yeah. the bun, oh. bacon, cheese, and sauce in between. And at the time, we were like, that's just crazy. Now, we've had stuff that we go, well, the Double Down's just kind of normal now. It's like the McRib. When it shows up, there's people like, give me a heart attack now. Although I've heard the McRib is never coming back. McDonald's said that the last time around was the last time around. Yeah, whatever. It reminds me of The Simpsons when they made fun of it. It's like, well, the animal that we use for it is <laughs> gone extinct. The pig thinks smaller. <laughs> uh, the chicken think more less. No, it was uh, the cow. No, think smaller. The pig think more legs. <laughs> all, all I'm thinking about is the the new movie they just announced, Rehab Bear. <laughs> I think we should do movies of every animal, you know, high on cocaine, except the first one would be Foofer, Cocaine Foofer. It lasted two seasons, Joe. Two whole seasons. Uh, Foofer and his friends have an enemy in a woman named Mrs. Amelia Escrow and her pet Chihuahua named Pepe who tries to expose Foofer's illegal roommates, but always to no avail. Mrs. Escrow has tried many times to sell the estate that Foofer and his his gang of dogs live on. But unbeknownst to her, Foofer and his friends keep the house from being bought as they also protect their home from rodents like the Rat Brothers, who uh, tend to mess with, mess with Foofer and his friends. Other cats like Vinny and the Cat Pack and greedy humans while trying to stop Mrs. Escrow, Foofer tries to avoid having his friends being captured by the Bowser Busters dog catchers, Mel and Harvey. In addition, an Afghan hound named Bert also, also antagonizes Foofer and competes with him to win the affection of a basset hound named Holly. This sounds like way too much story. Well, way now I don't have story. to. Now I got to pick another comic. Thanks a lot, Strode. Well, this is the cartoon. You can talk about the differences. No, no, um, he's ruining the spoilers. By the way, David, for, for David a, Aykroyd, oh? David Aykroyd was one of the uh, people who did voice acting, as was Henry Gibson, Frank Welker, Pat Carroll. Let's see who else? Boy, they had a lot of people doing voices. June Foray, of course, the queen of cartoons. Artie Johnson. Larry Storch, uh, Frank Nelson, Lynn Moody, and Melanie Griffin. Ooh. So there you go. There you go, people. Foofer 
lasted two seasons on NBC, created by Hanna-Barbera. Which means it's owned by uh, D Discovery Warner, which means it could show up in the uh, DC movie universe. So we got previews. It's a good thing I got number one. <laughs> we got previews. We does. Number 414 for March 23. With which the, means. Uh, what do we call it? Marvel number 18 and DC Connect number 34. We these cover for, everything. These are for comics coming out mostly in May, but some of them are June. And when it comes to trade paperbacks, they can be up to six to nine months away. You know how a couple of months ago I said you're going to save a lot of money because I didn't have a lot? Yeah. Oh, there's a lot this month. and most You should have put that money you saved away. Most of it is graphic novels. So I'm going to have to really decide what it is, which ones I want to buy. I, I don't know what this feast or famine thing. Ironically, not a lot from Marvel DC. But, you know, I don't want to give away too much. Uh, this is, when we do previews, we don't go through everything we buy. Oh, God, no. That would be up here till like 2 a.m. We only save that for pay-per-views. That's right. This is the new, new stuff, trade paperbacks, hardcovers, the collected editions, and then stuff that we may have that we want to point out that's being either resolicited or reprinted. On the cover is a new series from Image, Arcade Kings by Dylan Burnett and Walter Biamonte. And then on the back cover, Street Fighter VI, the official comic prequel to the all new fighting game. So I'm sure you're excited about that, Joe. Tremendously. You strike me yes, as uh, I, you strike me as someone who's deep into the mythology. I've I've never hit you once. <laughs> deep into the mythology of Street Fighter. Maybe, but I also watched a thirty minute amateur production of a guy putting together all a Doctor Who's Time War. So it's not outside the realm of possibility. Oh, okay. I mean, didn't Street Fighter fight Marvel? So there is a tie-in. Yeah, I have that. I have one of those games. I don't know which one it is because I'm not a... Fighting games are not what I like. And I know I they had a games. bunch of toy crossovers, too, where they're like, this has, you know, Finish Him, and this has Wolverine, and then... But, yeah, I, was, I wasn't big on it either. I am big on uh, first-person shooters. Doom is the greatest game of all time. Classic arcade, Japanese RPGs, and that's really kind of the ones that I stick to. A lot of classic arcade for me anymore. Matter of fact, when they put out those compilations, I am all over those. I'm The one I'm playing when I'm not in the middle of one of the RPGs is uh, the new version of Space Invaders they did a few years ago, where after you earn so many points, it, quote, evolves, unquote, so you get new bullets or new ships or new this or new that. They One of the, quote, bullets, unquote, is a gravity bullet. So when it hits something, it kind of creates a mini black hole and everything around it gets sucked in, which is really cool to see. Pew! 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 Suck, suck, suck. <laughs> They are still pushing a lot of the free comic book day stuff because they do that every month up until free comic book day. Nothing new announced. I also like how they they will they show the merchandise, but if you call your local comic shop and ask, hey, can you order this for me? They'll go, well, orders for that have already passed. So if you wanted that Etrigan the Demon, your shop has already ordered all the ones they're going to get. Same for the hats and the shirts and the bags and the lanyards and everything else. So they've probably already ordered all their free comic book day comics too. Oh yeah. So we will talk more about that as we get closer because it is, as always, the first Saturday in May. Hey, 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 it's May. So we're going to start with Image. Joe, what jumps out at you from Image? Ah! Oh, sorry. <laughs> Previews. Okay, let's jump to page 46. Again, this is interactive. 
so you can play along and try not to get paper cuts. Where am I? Where am I? Page 46. Thank you. I got to figure this out. I didn't bring my readers down. Arcade King, speaking of video games, they, they got a little blurb. says this is action adventure for fans of Invincible and Murder Falcon. Five issue series. Round one, fight. Joe, I like that already. A mysterious new face in Infinity City has suddenly become the hottest new player at the Roundhouse Arcade. Anyone can challenge him, but no one can win. But Joe's secret past is about to catch up to him when his most formidable challenge yet rolls into town, forcing Joe to combo his powers with a joystick, his fists, and his fighting family legacy. Got a couple pages of art to check out if you like it. And that's what really did it for me. Kind of get the idea that this is a video game type character and he's going to be hanging out with just a normal dude. And Carnish arcade colors. And the fact that it's a miniseries sounds pretty cool. For me, I went to page 58 before I found something. And that is Ooh. Star Signs Number 1 by Saladin Ahmed, art by... Megan Levins and Kelly Fitzpatrick, the constellations of the Zodiac fall to Earth, granting 12 ordinary people from very different walks of life superhuman powers of the star signs. But each of them is about to learn that with power always comes a price. Saladin Ahmed wrote one of my favorite comics of the last five years, the Black Bolt series, and then moved over to Miles Morales. He's a really good writer. With the stuff he's done before, he's earned the he's earned that uh, kind of thing in my head where it's oh anything he does I'm at least going to pick out pick up and check out so I'm going to be picking up and checking out Star Signs. Joe, actually have that on mine as well. So one less, but let's pop back to page fifty. Something epic. This is a larger than life fantastic epicy epic. For fans of 8 Billion Genies and Echo Lands, outside our perception, creative thoughts take physical form with only a handful of individuals known as epics able to interact with this wondrous hidden world. But for 14-year-old Danny Dillon, accepting these responsibilities himself won't be easy or safe. Lose yourself in a world of endless fantasy and creativity where superheroes, monsters, magical creatures and cartoon characters live and breathe alongside us. Some very small art to check out with small words. And you have a number of variant covers to check out. I'm trying to see what else we got. If it's Simon Kredansky, story and art. So looks intriguing. And for me, that was all from Image. Because I've got one more from they're Image. Not they're not reprinting any of the books that I buy in uh, trade paperback even. Yeah. So I'm saving some money there. Page 54, The Savage Strength of Starstorm. Number one, Drew Craig, Jason Feinstone, orphaned amne amnesiac high school student Grant Garrison. Boy, these guys are having the same problem Stan Lee did. Let's just alliterate names. Anyways, is just attempting to navigate his present and recall his past when a meteor decimates his school. In the rubble, Grant discovers a strange artifact from another galaxy, the weapon known as the Star Storm. With the power that resides within it will determine not only his and his friend's future, but the fate of the entire universe. A couple pages of preview art, and it was just enough interesting and colorful. I'll give it a shot. And that's it for me for Image. Next up is Boom. Boom. A couple things to point out from Boom, not things I'm necessarily going to get, but there is a one-shot Buffy on page 98. Buffy, the last vampire slayer, the lost summer. So you want to check that out. Casey Gilley, Lauren Knight. And on page 122, you know, we've raved about irredeemable for ages and they just did the that was where the superhero think superman goes totally bad the plutonium and they did a complete incorruptible 
a while back. Here is the other side of the story where a supervillain backs damage as an epiphany as his arch nemesis, the Plutonian, destroyed Sky City. And Max decides to step up. So this is what he's doing. There's a crossover between the two towards the end. But here is the Incomplete Incorruptible by Mark Wade. Tons of writers. I'm sorry, tons of artists. And you want to get between this and I believe it was a couple months ago, the uh, Incorruptible. You got to get these two books because they're just phenomenal. And that's it for Boom. I want to point out, uh, by the way, the previous book is Irredeemable. That's where the superhero goes bad. Incorruptible is where the supervillain goes good. And that's this month. Yeah, yeah. Oh, but the the Buffy thing, they're already – here's the problem that I have with some of these TV tie-ins, and Boom is making what I consider a huge mistake. I'm a Buffy fan. So Dark Horse had the Buffy comic originally that was just kind of like the Star Star Trek comics and things like that where it's – Kind of in the same continuity, but you don't, it doesn't tie in because it really can't. You, the people making the TV show aren't paying attention to the comic. Cool. I'm fine with that. Having read Star Trek novels since 1978, I'm used to that. I understand. So then Dark Horse and Joss Whedon say, all right, because Buffy's no longer coming out, we're going to put out a comic that continues the story. And it will be the quote official, unquote, continuation of Buffy. Cool, fine. Josh Whedon's involved, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It finishes up because it goes over to Boom. Boom then says, okay, what we're going to do, we're going to reboot the whole thing. So we're going to retell the stories that have been told with maybe some twists and maybe some changes. I mean, and I know that IDW tried that with the Star Trek Kelvin comics, and they quickly abandoned it because it became very dull. It's like, oh, okay, we're going to do a different version of the story where Kirk's brother died. We're going to do a different version of the Tholian web. We're going to do a different version of this. Ugh. No, no, we, we don't want that. We don't care. So Buffy, they did that, and then they did, okay, we're doing another one with a different continuity that is a darker, grittier version of Buffy. And now this one ties in with the TV continuity. Now imagine I was a fan of Buffy the Vampire Slayer who did not read all of the minutia in previews. I would pick it up and go, I don't, well, they're the same characters, but they're all screwed up. I don't want to read that. Oh, they're doing a new Buffy series. Pick it up. Oh, this is even more screwed up. I don't want to read that. Now they're coming out and, oh, this will tie into the TV show. You've already burned people twice. They're not coming back a third time. When you do a TV or a movie or something tie in, It's a bad idea to, we're going to change the continuity for this. No, just do a tie-in. That's all you need to do. Tie-ins are easy. You don't need to reimagine. You don't need to reboot. You don't need to do any of that stuff because the people who are coming for the tie-in, they just want more stories about the characters that they like. It would be like if I were to go and pick up Star Trek issue 15, And it's set in a universe where Spock is the captain of the Enterprise and the Vulcans and the Klingons have formed an alliance. I would read it and go, they got all the continuity wrong and not read it again. You got to be, it's not so much a geeking, but what what the hell are they thinking? Yeah, you know Marvel or DC, you can't slap a w- elsewhere or what if label on it and say, yeah, this is what's happening. 
Everybody's a zombie. Deceased. That's kind of what drove me away from DC. Picking up a book and going, well, it said that this is part of continuity, but Superman's an old. Superman's got gray hair and he's hanging out with John F. Kennedy. The hell? Uh, Dark Horse is next, but one Dark Horse thing, is weird, Joe. I've got one thing in Dark Horse that I'm interested in. Before we do that, did you look at the second listing of Dark Horse stuff? Yep, on page 297 to 298. That's where all the books are. So all the comics are in the front part. Yep. And the collected editions are in the everything else. Yep. But they don't mention that anywhere. And I wonder if that's because Dark Horse is gone. Their books are now with a different distributor. Eh, who knows? So, but do you want to do Dark Horse as a single unit? Sure. Okay. Well, then we'll start on page 133. The only comic that's coming out that I'm interested in. A six-issue miniseries from Michael Bendis and... I'm sorry, Brian Michael Bendis and Michael Avon Oming. Discover, it's called Murder, Inc. Jag, Jagger Rose. Discover a world in which five families of organized crime never lost their stranglehold on the United States. Now, half the country is a smorgasbord of sex and sin ruled by a loyalty and, air quotes, family values. And the rest of the world looks on in awe Rage or jealousy. Newly made Valentine Gallo and Jagger Rose rise to the ranks of the notorious Boniverse family. No spoilers, but Jagger has already proven herself one of the greatest assassination of all times. And uh, the Pope would like a word. Yeah, that Pope. <laughs> I'll give that one a shot. Any comics for you? No. All right, folks. This is highly absurd, but jump to page 297. Give you a chance to uh, go out of, out of. And on page 297, it's the first of the books I'm getting. Yep. Another big old reprint of Mike Mignola stuff. This is the same format as the Omnibus, but they're not calling it an Omnibus. It is Abe Sapien, The Drowning and Other Stories. In the early 1980s, new BPRD agent Abe Sapien was set to remove the corpse of a powerful warlock off the coast of France. Abe quickly finds himself in a battle with a century-old evil in the form of demonic mon monks. It's Mike Nignola. It's in the Hellboy universe. I'm picking it up. For me, the big one is on page 299, The Legend of Luther Arkwright Hardcover. By Brian Tabbitt. It's a I love that story so much. <laughs> it, it takes the adventures of Luther Arkwright and its sequel, Heart of Empire, and puts it together. And I guess there's a third Arkwright saga. I can't tell if that's part of this. Definitely Joe, this, this is the third one. Oh, this is the third one? Yeah, this is the oh. third one. Okay, you guys suck. Make a fucking <laughs> omnibus. Don't buy this. Okay, end of end of review. <laughs> I mean, I'm reading this. I'm reading this thinking the way. First of all, the fact that you're somewhere else in the book screwed me up. But I'm also like, oh, oh, it's all together for thirty nine ninety nine. No, whatever. Nope, nope. Out. Forget it. Matter of fact, I'll just get it out the there. Oh, I shouldn't have done that. There's something on the other page I want to talk about. Oh well, we'll talk about it when we get back. All right, on page two ninety eight. The Black Hammer Omnibus Volume 2, Black Hammer, was the superhero book put together by Jeff Lemire. Um, this is a conclusion to the Eisner Award-winning superhero saga. If you've read the first Black Hammer, you know, you've got to get the second half of the story. If you have not read Black Hammer, you have to pick up the first omnibus to know what's going on. It's one of those books. This is a world where a number of superheroes descended upon Earth years ago, and they've now kind of been put away. They live, they live quiet, normal lives, but something calls them out. Also on this page is BRPD 
BPRD, Omnibus Volume 6, more Hellboy stuff from Mike Mignola. My God, he has done so much Hellboy stuff. <laughs> also want to point out in this page, Creepy Archives Volume 2. I will let you know when to stop picking up Creepy if you're just a, a casual reader. But the first... The first uh, six, seven years of both Creepy and Eerie, where they were edited by Archie Goodwin, are some of the greatest comics you will ever read. Archie Goodwin, huge fan of EC, got a number of EC artists and new artists to put together horror stories, and they did them as a magazine for Jim Warren to escape the comics code. So you've got uh, Frank Verzetta. Joe, you ever heard of him? Mm, I think, didn't he do a toy in the 90s? Yeah, yeah. Alex Toth, Gray Morrow, Reed Crandall, John Severin. This reprints Creepy Magazine 6 through 10. All of the original letters, pages, tech features, and ads. Then on the next page, EC Archives Two Fisted Tales, Volume 1. Two Fisted Tales was the first comic edited by Harvey Kurtzman. They... Basically, Kurtzman was an artist. They promoted him to editor, and they asked him what kind of comic he wanted to do, and he said he wanted to do an action-adventure comic. And they were like, oh, well, uh, like, like what? So he put together the first issue, and they said, oh, okay. Now, during uh, once the Korean War broke out, Two Fist Details turned into a war comic. But here, it's more just an action-adventure comic. It may have some war stories in it, but it's not the focus of the book. Uh, Harvey Kurtzman stuff. Anything Harvey Kurtzman touches was gold. And you've already heard me go on and on and on about EC, so I don't need to do it again. But this is a paperback, so you could get the first five issues. I'm sorry, six issues of Two Fisted Tales with art from Wally Wood, Johnny Craig, Jack Davis, Al Feldstein, John Severin, Will Elder, and Dave Berg. Yeah, that Dave Berg. Yeah, the guy from Mad. Uh, for 20 bucks. Buy it. Joe, anything else from Dark Horse? Not this month. I have one other thing from Dark Horse, and that is on page 301. That is the world of Black Hammer Omnibus. These are side stories and miniseries that took place in the same universe as Black Hammer, but were not part of the main story. And now we go back. Back to page 150 in Dynamite. It looks like Dynamite is mining Disney stuff that Marvel ain't going to do. Case Marvel and, and Boom. Yeah. Because remember, Boom is part owned by Fox, which is now owned by Disney. Yeah. And th in this case, it is Disney villains Maleficent, who I think is quite possibly one of the coolest villains, mainly because she actually, uh, I don't know, man, that fight between her and the prince at the end was pretty, uh, in Sleeping Beauty, was pretty intense. But here's your chance because Dynamite and Disney are proudly present Maleficent, Queen of the Forbidden Mountain. Her realm is shrouded in darkness and evil and full of all things that go bump in the night. Her soul is cold, hardened by a lifetime of small-minded wanderers seeking to steal her powers to satisfy their mortal greed. This ain't your mama's wicked, okay? But her patient wears thin, her mystic might grows. It's only a matter of time before she descends the mountain unleashes her horrible magics on the powerless people below. Tons of variants. On page 154, you get an interview with the uh, writer-artist, Su Li, and she explains the roots of Maleficent's villainy. For me, what I judge this by the first two that have hit, Gargoyles and Darkwing Duck, which, judging by what's left on the stands, sold magnificently. Tons of variant covers. You can choose your poison. There's a couple metal, like Jay Lee's got a metal cover, two in a virgin cover. I'm looking to possibly get the Sue Lee signed with the CGC uh, Certificate of Authenticity. I got to check maybe with uh, my buds at Granite City because Discount Comic Book Service doesn't list everything. So 
So that's kind of uh, that's a big one for me. Anything else for you, Corey? I uh, I want to point out Vampirella versus the Superpowers. This is another one I will pick up when it's collected as a trade. This is a tie-in because Lord knows Dynamite has to have Vampirella show up everywhere. Oh hell yeah! With their superhero universe, which is all made up of public domain heroes. Joe, I want you to look over the covers and let me know what superheroes you see. I only see one. Yep, and that is a, a character design and not a cover. Dynamite! They have no superheroes, <laughs> just Vampirella drawings for they this know it's comic. So, they know, and if you don't got enough Vampirella, page 164, 165, there's tons of hardcovers, there's a, a 45 piece limited edition proof statue, just tons of stuff. On the next page, on page 166, for you Avira fans, Avira and Monsterland, tons of variant covers. Uh, there is a, this is the movie multiverse adventure. On the following page, you have an interview with uh, David Avalon, who is introducing the monsters. And then, again, tons of different variant covers. There's an Atlas signed edition that's signed not only by, my my guess is Elvira, judging by the price, including a photo cover. I may have to think about that one. Page 169, you could get the hardcover edition that's signed by her. The following couple pages has the classic years, I believe, that were back in, they're published in Claypool, 1993. There's the Mistress of the Dark trade paperback offered again. You can get an Elvira. Well, they call it a spectral switchboard, but we know it's a Ouija board. Metal Crypt cards. So a lot of, lot of fun stuff. And for me, that's it for Dynamite. And so now, should we go to DC or to Marvel? Uh, I got DC right here. Now, you see, you got a physical copy of DC. I'm I did. A physical copy of DC in a couple of weeks. That surprised, and I bitched about it last week, and that really surprised the heck out of me, that it showed up in my box day because I ship every five. Yet it didn't show up in Corey's. Who, what do you get yours? Every two hours two, or something? Every two weeks. Two hours. That's what I thought. So, come on, DC. You got one job. Step up. Because I got to tell you, I'm getting excited with some of the stuff you're offering. I've been really down on DC for a while for various reasons. <laughs> Phantom Stranger Omnibus. But you got some stuff here that's got my attention. Uh, let's go right to page two and jump right in. This is all Dawn of DC, and it all comes out of Dark Crisis. It all comes out of Leviathan, whatever. I've read Dark Crisis. I'll pick up Leviathan whenever the trade's offered. But you got Titans number one. And let's see who's doing it. Tom Tyler, Nicole Scott, lots of varying covers. Even put up, pulled up the boss himself, Jim Lee. And there's a Jen Bartell. The Teen Titans are ready to grow up. Each member joined as a much younger hero, certain that one day they'd be invited to join the Justice League. But the time has come for them not to join the league, but to replace it. Are the no longer teen heroes ready for the big leagues? Danger lurks around every corner as heroes and villains alike challenge the new team before they've even begun. Will the DCU ever, ever be the same? This is the landmark first issue. Tons of variant covers, some art to check it out. This one's got me kind of excited. What's, what's um, first on your list there, Mr. C? First on my list is Shazam number oh, one. Oh, that's on my list too. Written by Mark Wade. That's all I needed uh, to see. A, yeah, yeah. Shazam, Mark Wade, slam dunk, grand slam, Super Bowl ring, boom. But they've said dinosaurs from space, the clubhouse of eternity, homicidal worms and talking tigers, atomic robots, alien worlds, mad scientists, sinister curses, and villains from throughout the DC universe. See, want to stop Lex Luthor and the Joker? Call Superman and Batman. International Crisis, page Wonder Woman. But when Gargux, Emperor of the Moon, sets his sight on Gorilla City, that's when you shout Shazam. I think Mark Wade's going to have a lot of fun with this. 
the original Captain Marvel is a tricky character because if you look at his past, his stuff were more fairy tales for kids than superhero books. So I don't think you could do fairy tales for kids and have it sell well. But to bring that sort of whimsy and imagination to a superhero book, I, if anybody could do it, Mark Wade can do it. I, and I'm even looking at the variant covers. They look kind of fun. I don't know if I want to go with the, the one by Dan Mora. There's one by Chris Samney. The spot foil cover by Mike Diodato looks good. I, I, may, I may end up getting more than just one variant on this one because they all look so cool. On the next page, another one that's very, very intriguing. Green Lantern number one, Jeremy Adams. I have no idea who's doing the art and cover. Sir Mon Nicole. Gotta love them one names. This spins out of Dark Crisis. Guardians of the OA at the heart of the Green Lantern Corps have quarantine sector 2814. Uh, tell them what, Corey, tell them what sector uh, 2814 is. That's Earth. What? And it's champion along with it. And a heartbreaking defeat has sent Hal reeling, returning home to rediscover his roots and find the man responsible for ruining his life, Sinestro. So let's see. This is as a tale of redemption, loss, and finding out that maybe, just maybe, you can go home again. At least if you're willing to hotwire a power ring to do it. And then there's also a part one of John Stewart's War Journal. So a couple of pages of concept art, really tiny pitches of the variant covers. So, and what's cool is if you want to see the images of all the variant covers not featured in the catalog, you can go to lunardistribution.com backslash home backslash media, or just dump the page 56 because it's written there. So what's next for you, Corey? Gosh, it's like we're, it's like we're looking at a Marvel. It what? is. Slowing right through this thing, man. Page number eight, Batman, oh. Brave and the Bold, number one. Batman. Coming out the spectacular success of One Bad Day, the Riddler, the Eisner winning award team of Tom King and Mitch Gerard reunite for a four-part retelling of the first bloody clash between the Joker and the Batman. But this is an anthology book. I know. So you got to watch. First of all, anthologies may or may not last. It depends if they stick with A creative teams or they start slipping into the D teams. But that first one. We've also got a Stormwatch story, a story, a new series of Batman black and white short stories, and Order of the Black Lamp, which Superman finds a decoder ring and a secret message, Save Me, which sends him on a quest to solve a mystery with ties to the Man of Steel's past. There are a bunch of uh, covers here. I, of course, will be getting the uh, the Cho cover. Oh, yeah. I was going to mention that. <laughs> yeah, I'm getting the Frank Cho cover. I'm going to take a break for a moment because the next couple of things I'm not necessarily interested in, although they really sound interesting. And kudos to DC. From page 10 through 16, they're running a bunch of miniseries. The first one is is Cyborg. The next one is Spirit World, which uh, all new hero travels between the land of living and dead. The Vigil, discover the secrets of the group that watches after the DC universe. That one's actually looks interesting. And on page 16, City Boy, a new teen hero that controls the cities of the DC universe. And those actually, kudos to DC for at least trying something new. You got thousands of characters. You know, no reason not to get a decent proposal up and bang it out. A lot of these, they sound interesting. I will probably wait for a trade or if, if it happens to be a slow comic day. Like I said, once I get my total figured out of all these, the vigil is the one that really gets my attention. On these pages, Corey, are there any of these three or four miniseries that, that you're going to pick up or has your attention? I because they're miniseries, I'm going to wait and pick them up as trade paperbacks. But I did read a lot of these characters were kind of previewed in the Lazarus Planet. Mm -hmm. And the one that 
was the most interesting to me was City Boy. I I really thought that that was interesting. He let's see, he's able to speak to cities to find lost and hidden goods to pawn, and it's only just enough to get by. But these abilities mean he hears everything everywhere all the time, including each city's histories and the truth behind them. It's very loud in his head and something he has to live with. As his powers get stronger, the cities start forming animal avatars from scraps in order to physically travel alongside him in his adventures. It almost feels like a a, a modern version of Kid Eternity. Because Kid Eternity was able to call forth characters from history, City Boy is able to call forth characters from the city he's in. Done right, it could be really, really interesting. Greg Pak has done right in his previous stuff. You may know Greg Pak from his uh, Planet Hulk story. So he's very creative. He's able to take a look at things and kind of see them in a new way. Uh, this one I'm going to be interested in, but with a lot of these, because they're miniseries, they're going to put them out as trade paperbacks, and by then I'll be able to get reviews on whether they're good or not. Who knows? Maybe even you will review some of them. Yeah, because I'm the other way. I'll pick them up, and if I don't like them, I'll put them on the Ebays. Uh, we also have a special issue of Batman. No, 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 no. Batman! Oversized 900th issue. The conclusion to the best-selling Batman, the Batman of Gotham, so big it could only be contained in an oversized 900th anniversary issue. Uh, Chip Zdarsky's run on Batman has been very good. It seems that Batman has become a book that DC really kind of curates and wants to make sure that they've got the best possible creative team. Jorge, Jorge Jimenez is the main artist on it with Matt Hawthorne doing art as well. And you've got a variant cover by Joe Casada. What? Oh my. Yeah, Joe Casada, remember, he stepped down from his position at Marvel because he wanted to get back to drawing. Cool. On the next page, Power Girl Special. I will point that out because I've seen people selling some of these variant covers online already for silly money. And why do you think people are buying all these Power Girl variant covers? Tell them, Corey. Boobs. Oh, yeah. Big time. <laughs> so here's your chance to check it out. The story actually sounds pretty fun. It's by Leah Williams. Art and cover by, well, one of the covers. Margaret Salvage? I'm sorry. Call, call me, Margaret. I, I screwed up your name. I don't have my readers on. How many times can I say that before I smart up and get my readers down here? But Power Girl takes center stage, new powers, new mission. Power Girl faces a challenge unlike any she's experienced before in this shocking one shot rising from the events of the Lazarus Planet and Action Comics. So for a one shot, plus I know I can, you know, but what do we got here? Let's see. Stanley Art Germ, Amanda Connor. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And if you can get that one in 50 variant, that's money in the bank. Joe, do you want a cheap read? Yes. On page 25, Ooh. New Talent Showcase, the Milestone Initiative. In May of 2022, 12 writers and 12 artists came to DC's headquarters to hone their skills with some of the best comic creators in the business. One year later, we're showing the results of their hard work. This special showcases all 12 stories created out of the Ally-sponsored Milestone Initiative. It's 112 pages. Joe, how much would you pay for this? Would you pay $12.99? Uh, yeah, maybe. Would you pay $9.99? Oh, uh, I already said it'd be twelve ninety, but yeah, okay, nine ninety nine, sure. How about if we sold it for five ninety nine? That'd be crazy. How, how that, are you going to be making money on that? That's almost. A sh I'd definitely shoe into that. It's selling for three ninety nine. One hundred twelve uh, pages for three ninety nine. Good grief! It's so cheap you have to buy it. Yeah, I know. Funny thing is, when I was at the last sale for the people who became Most Wanted Comics, I don't know if they were calling themselves Most Wanted Comics then, but I actually found a whole bunch of New Talent Showcase, 
And I remember in the 80s picking up the first few issues. And of course, we we made fun of it by calling it No Talent Showcase. (laughs) And the sad thing is you look through and it's a lot of people's first work. And many of them did not go on to do more comics, but some of them did. And some of them had really good careers. It's kind of like the Marvel, the Marvel tryout book. The winner was Mark Bagley, but I, the, the second runner up, I'm sorry, the runner up, Tom Tenney also worked at Marvel for a long time. So these new talent initiatives, they usually find people. It's just whether that those people are willing to put in the hustle and the work to get jobs. So I'm interested to see what this is. I always like reading anthologies and with new talent, that's kind of cool too. Joe? On page 28, I think they're positioning Peacemaker to be DC's version of the Punisher. And you know what? I'm okay with that. I loved the TV show. It's a black label, so they don't have to hold back. And we'll see where they go. This is part of a six-issue miniseries. Having earned his release from the Suicide Squad, Peacemaker wants to try and do normal superhero stuff for a change. Unfortunately, everybody, including the bad guys, thinks he sucks at superhero stuff. But when busting up a terrorist ring introduces Christopher Smith to the cutest thing ever to walk awkwardly on four legs, uh, he finds the unconditional love he's been denied his whole life. That is until the dog is kidnapped right out from under him by a supervillain who has some very unsuper heroic plans for Peacemaker's brand of ultraviolence. Corey, how does that work when you steal the superhero's dog? Uh, ask John Wick. Yes. Does not go well. Will he help an inf- infamously unstable superpowered criminal steal the world's most valuable and dangerous DNA? Honestly, Christopher's pretty lonely, so he probably just depends on how nicely they ask. So a couple pages to uh, check it out. And they're very much making this look like a John Cena. So let's go for it. Sounds like fun. And of course, obviously going to be a trade if it's just going to be a six issue miniseries. And for me, it then goes into the collected editions. Me too. And there aren't a lot, but there's one I want to point out. It's uh, being resolicited. No, 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 it's not Phantom Stranger. Oh, I was about to have a heart attack. No, it's Batman Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Omnibus on page yes. 44. Yep. Uh, this reprints Batman Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 1 through 6, Batman Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2, 1 through 6, and Batman Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3, 1 through 6. This is uh, 100 pages. I'm sorry, $100, 576 pages. So it's smaller than a regular omnibus. But again, you know, you. It's a co-publication. But here's the thing. This will probably never, ever, ever be reprinted. Yep. Yep. Those, so I if tell you would ever want this, you better order it now. Yeah. Uh, the Star Trek Planet of the Apes, Star Trek Doctor Who, they're just silly prices because even the Marvel DCs, we just saw that even with the reprint in order to, to benefit uh, George Prez before he passed away. Silly money. So if you are all interested in it, or if you're just one of those guys, you know, I think I'll buy the omnibus and just sit on it, see what happens to it. Go for it. This is your second chance. Because I know we talked about this when it was first solicited. One that I may pick up, uh, back on page 35, Swamp Thing Green Hell, written by Sweet Tooth creator Jeff Lemire. And DC super artist Doug Mankey. This is a collection of Swamp Thing Green Hell 1 through 3. Earth is all but done. The last remains of humanity cling to a mountaintop island lost in endless flood water. The parliaments of the green, the red, and the rot have united their powers to summon an avatar, a horrific humanity killing monster who could only be stopped by Alec Holland. Shame Alec's been dead for decades. So. I, you know, I don't know if I bought this. I just got my box day and I haven't opened it yet. So I don't know if I have this in box or not, but if if not, I might see if I can find, if I can't find one through three at my local comic book shop, I will definitely be picking this up because I love Doug Mankey's art and it just, it what Jeff wrote looks creepy as hell. And the last thing for DC for me is on page 55, the unwritten compendium 
Volume 1. This was another Vertigo book by Mike Carey and Peter Gross, who were the, the creators on Books of Magic, the original Books of Magic series. So this was their next one. Boy Wizard Tommy Taylor is the main character in a series of fantasy novels by author Winston, Wilson Taylor that have become a cultural phenomenon. However, as a result of Tommy's success, the real Tom Taylor, the son Wilson long abandoned, is worshipped worldwide as a literary legend made flesh. As Tom's life begins to take on an eerie and deadly parallels with Tommy's, he's drawn into a strange library underworld where the power of storytelling is as strong as any spell. This will be a two-volume set. This was back from Vertigo's Golden Age. Uh, I did not pick it up at the time because I was saying, oh, I'll pick it up as trades. And then when it came out as trades, I missed it because I was uh, working where I couldn't afford a lot of comics. So now it's coming out as a compendium. I like the compendiums. It's an omnibus, but it's paperback. So it's uh, 984 pages for 60 bucks. And that's it for DC for me. I got a couple things I'll point out. On page 40, young Alfred, Payne and the butler, looks intriguing because it's Alfred attends Gotham Servants School. Sorry, Gotham Servants School. He's a clumsy and nervous boy going to fulfill his father's last wish. He will become a butler. But when he suspects that his new school may be involved in a criminal plot, Alfred must look within himself to see if he has what it takes to be not only a butler, but a hero. So it's, it's a young kid, I guess younger kid book, but it sounds funny, you know, and I've, I've enjoyed some of the other ones. Let's see, pop about on page 44. Again, down below is the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles omnibus up above. If you've never read it, like me, deceased box set. Here's your chance to get them all in soft cover in a cool box set. Looks like four volumes for a hundred bucks, which is about pretty good. The reason I mention it is because I actually had a variant cover of number one I found in a dollar bin and I read it and it was like, it's actually reads pretty good if you want a good zombie tale. And then across from it, you know me, I love a good facsimile edition, Batman 181 facsimile edition. This is the first appearance of Poison Ivy. What I love about them is that it has the ads, it has the letters, pages, house ads, other goofy ads, sell grit, whatever. I know there was a, a bit of a brouhaha online because apparently in the wizard, I'm sorry, Shazam, no, what was it? Wiz number two, there was some discrepancies between the way the original looked and the way this one looked. And I'm kind of like, well, I don't know, for a golden age reprint, I just want the feel of what it would like. So I can imagine, hey, I just picked this off the newsstand or I just found somebody at a at a flea market selling it for 12 cents. That's an awful lot for a used comic. How about I give you six cents? We call it even. <laughs> and that's it for me. DC, that is. And now it's time for where most of my money goes. That's Marvel. We got a new Avengers number one, Joe. I saw that. I'm on that too. Writer Jed McKay, artist C.F. Villa. I know neither of these people. <laughs> but you will. Yeah. I, I, they wouldn't give them the Avengers if they weren't. It's not like the 90s where it's, all right, who's sitting around the office? Oh, you, do you want to write the Avengers? No. Nope, I want to they, write Ghost Rider. They get a lot of pitches. So I trust in Tom Brevoort. And I imagine that uh, the uh, current Avengers series, which wraps up the month before this, that's going to be another bunch of omnibuses, isn't it? Yeah. I hope so, because I, I checked out about 50, issue 50, after realizing I haven't read it since issue 35. And I was like, you know what? I, I know I'm going to like it. Every time I read this stuff in uh, omnibus form, so. And to celebrate. Celebrate. They're putting out facsimile editions of Avengers number one and Iron Man number one. Joe, is Iron Man number one his first appearance? No, that was uh, Tales of Suspense. 
So if this is 1968, after years of sharing a split title with Captain America, Iron Man blasted into his own solo series for the first time. And that's because Marvel could only publish eight comics until they got a new distribution deal in 1968. Their, their distribution was controlled by National Periodicals, otherwise known as DC. And when Martin Goodman sold to, I think it was Perfect Film. Yeah, Perfect Film. Perfect Film got them a new distribution deal and they could publish as many comics as they wanted. So all the split books became separate series. Uh, Joe, was this the first Iron Man number one? No. What was the first Iron Man number one? I believe it was a uh, mixed book with Iron Man and Submariner. Yep. They, they made the change to split the books into individual books so fast that there was a Iron Man and Submariner story that were already done. So they were like, okay, we'll put out a comic that has that uses those up, then we'll get a Submariner number one and an Iron Man number one. And you want to know what's depressing about all three of those books? They're probably not worth as much as you think they would be. No, I actually had owned original copies of these at one time. And if, since I think the Iron Man one, Pat and I picked up in our infamous X collection, which was a major, I, I, it wasn't a gathered collection, like, you know, you and I going to a comic store, but there was a guy who bought them off the newsstand at the time. And then uh, Avengers number one, I believe I bought from the UPS driver who had one and he brought it in and I said, oh, wow, for him. So, and of course I look at these and I go, ah, Adam. I had an an Iron Man Submariner for a few years, but one of my friends was that was the like the last book he needed for his Submariner connect collection. So I remember I sold it to him for what about I think he he talked me down to about three fourths of guide. Hmm. But now he has a complete Submariner col collection, but I haven't heard from him in I would say twenty years. Yep. See, once he's used you for a Submariner, you're you're nothing. Yeah, I'm kind of used to that. Bought some. They, that, they, there are some people, once they get for what they want from you, they're going to discard you. Then they'll come back a little later and go, hey, you still have something I want. You know <laughs> what you do with those people, Joe? You let them read Carnage comics. You, you flip them the bird and move on with your life. Um, and I say Carnage because... The next comic I have pretty much skips almost everything that has to do with the Carnage crossover because I just have never been a Carnage guy. You know, I was cheering when Century ripped them in half back in Avengers. <laughs> the next one I have is Groot number one. Dan Abbott, Damien Conciero, monster hero, guardian Groot. Before he was guarding the galaxy, before Groot fall. Young Groot lived a tranquil life on a serene homeworld, but when monstrous invaders attack his planet, Groot must accept his heroic destiny. Will this destiny lead him to come to blows with a young Kree soldier by the name of Marvel? Well, four issues to find out. So, this one actually, uh, I think I am Groot. Yeah, by uh, Dan Abnett, the guy who grabbed Groot and reworked him. No, wait, I'm wrong. It was Keith Giffen who did that. Dan Abnett picked up the book right after. So I apologize. It was Keith Giffen who made that change. By the way, Amazing Spider-Man number 25 is being pushed as the most significant event in Spider-Man since the death of Gwen Stacy. Hmm. I wonder. Uh, the past and the present collide for this oversized monumental 25th issue. Your heart isn't ready for this one. My heart. By the way, the uh, explanation of why Spider-Man and everybody hated Spider-Man and Spider-Man number one is coming out uh, this, this week. Ooh, I may have to go. I don't know if I can wait a copy you know, in case somebody spoils it. Page 65, <laughs> Hulk annual number one. Hulk versus Giganto. That's all you got. That's all I need. Gigantor. Gigantor. Toe, toe, toe. 
Oh. I'm going to get sued. So documentary crew is on hunt for a monster at the heart of a gamma radiation leak, but they get much more than they bargained for when they end up on the Hulk's angry side, caught in the middle of a brawl between two unstoppable giants. Hulk battles the unleashed giganto. And then, of course, there's a preview for the shocking new direction Hulk is heading for this summer, which is good for me because I bailed on the one he was on right now. By the way, Joe, go back to page, what is it, 58? 58. Fantastic Four number seven, which is also Fantastic Four number 700. What a coink a dink. I am friends with uh, Scott Koblish uh, on the Facebooks. Sorry to hear that, Scott. He posted the 700 character wraparound variant cover. Huh? Oh, dear God. <laughs> <laughs> There's 700 characters on that cover. Because <laughs> he posted it, and then I blew it up. Then I had to blow it up more. Then I had to blow it up more. Uh, I am not a variant cover guy. Everybody knows that. I hated variant covers back when they started them. Back in 1989. I'm buying that variant cover. <laughs> the problem is it says it's linking. What's it linking to? The next issue. Oh, bastards. Well, I 700 characters. Too. I know. <laughs> and how many? Is oh, it is two? crazy. Yeah, two. Oh. It is a crazy piece of art. You're looking at it going, I, I, how did he have the patience for this? I hope they paid him well. Mm -hmm. Because, oh, my gosh. I remember when George Perez had that cover to um, uh, JLA Avengers number three. Is that oh, the one that had everybody on it? I believe so, yeah. Yeah, this one is even bigger and crazier. It's insane. It's an insane cover. Uh, when they post it online, go take a look. That is it for me for actual comics. Me as well. So let's go to, let's say goodbye to my money. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was good while it last. I do want to point out. I am on the fence about this book, Joe. Okay. Which means I will probably buy it. Page 85. 85. Avengers Omnibus number five. The Crossing. This was my golden age of the Avengers. I started Ooh. getting Avengers with Avengers 141. And this is Avengers 120 to 149, as well as Giant Size Avengers 1 through 4. Captain Marvel, which means it ties in with the uh, Thanos story. Fantastic Four 150, which means it ties in with the wedding of Quicksilver and Crystal. Uh, this was uh, Steve Englehart with Roy Thomas. Jim Starla, Gary Conway, got that two-part Tony Isabella villain that was done with uh, Tony Isabella and Don Heck. George Perez, Sal Buscema, George Tuska, Bob Brown, with John Buscema, Dave Cochran, Rich Buckler, Don Heck, Jim Starlin, and Keith Pollard. I am so tempted to pick this up, even though I've got, yeah, I've got it as essentials, and I've got it as trades, but I, 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 I may sell the trades just because this is this is an omnibus I would get out of pure nostalgia because this was my Avengers. I started reading the Avengers the same issue George Perez started drawing the Avengers, and it was inked by Vince Coletta. So, dear God. <laughs> uh, on the next page, Thor by Jason Aaron Omnibus Two on page 87 yep. finishes up the his run on thor it only has the main story for war of the realms so if you want the entire war of the realms you have to have the war of the realms omnibus Which but I it know. has but it's got all of his issues of thor the unworthy thor generations the unworthy thor and the mighty thor mighty thor at the gates of valhalla thor 1 through 16 and king thor 1 through 4 Jason Aaron on Thor was fantastic. And yes. it was one of those where I remember reading the first story and telling you this Gore the God Butcher is really cool. And they brought Jane Foster back and I'm not telling you anything about it. Little did I know how how the 
book would continue to get better and better and better. Ah, uh, for the first time in a long time, Thor was a must read book for me. I did not read much of it. So when I went through it via the complete collections and then ripped open my mint copy of War of the Realms, oh, it was good. Because I read War of the Realms as it came out and I was like, I don't really know what's going on. But once you start, yeah, it's it's beautiful. Omnibus form, complete collections. I'm sure there'll be epic collections. Yeah, this is definitely a run you want to pick up. Uh, then on page 88, a book uh, I am on the fence about. Uh, me as well. X-Men The Hidden Years by John Byrne. And the reason I am on the fence about it, this is John Byrne coming back to Marvel in the late 90s. And when Byrne came back to Marvel, he really wanted to undo everything that had been done since 1971. And this was a way for him to do that. This was the X-Men between when their book was canceled with X-Men 66 and the new X-Men with X-Men, giant size X-Men number one. He was filling in stories. Now, I remember reading it at the time and liking it, but also going, wow, Byrne is using a lot of stock poses and a lot of computer rendered backgrounds. And then when it was canceled, he threw a hissy fit and swore he'd never work for Marvel again. The book was fantastic and they just don't like it. John, it's the worst selling X-Men book. The worst. Okay? When something is the worst selling book in a line and the company's in bankruptcy, it's a rent don't buy situation. And he never, he never understood that. Well, I know I never got royalties on it, but still it was John Byrne on X-Men. They should have let me do what I wanted. What do you think you're Chris Claremont? They don't even let Chris Claremont do what he wants. They pay him not to write. <laughs> Byrne, they don't pay him not to draw. <laughs> so he draws. <laughs> and we'll give it to Marvel. But I remember liking it at the time, and I'm wondering if I go back and read it, I won't have the sort of the, the, the icky haze that came over it when he started bad-mouthing Marvel and trashing everybody who worked there and saying, John Byrne's one of those guys that if you don't read anything he says online, you'll like him a lot better. On the next page is a Wolverine omnibus that will sell well, but I won't buy it. Uh, <laughs> On page 90 is Sins of Sinister, which is the current X-Men crossover going on. I've learned that, you know how I'm buying the X-Men paperbacks that tell the story in chronological order? When they get to these crossovers, they do nice big hardcovers that are too expensive for what they reprint. Like the first Hellfire Gala was 75 bucks. This one is also 75 bucks for 344 pages. But they're so pretty. They reproduce so well. I'll yeah. wait for the cover. Yeah, I'll probably pick it up because I'm a mark. And I, I didn't read the crossover. I kind of stepped back and figured, oh, I got to pick this up. But on right. the next page is the rest of the Marvel Zomni Marvel Zombie story, Marvel Zomnibus Returns. It has uh, Deadpool, Merc with the Mouth, one through thirteen, Zombie Christmas Carol, one through five, Marvel Zombies Destroy, one through five, Marvel Zombies Halloween, Marvel Zombies the twenty fifteen, one through four, Age of Ultron versus Marvel Zombies, one through four, Marvel Zombie. Simon Garth, number one, Marvel Zombies Resurrection one, and Marvel Zombies Resurrection one through four, taking us all the way up to 2020. And they haven't used the Marvel Zombies since, I don't think. But I imagine they will again. But if you get this, you've and the first one, you've got the whole thing. And then one I'm not getting because I did not care for this when it came out, but I want to point it out for people. And that is a new printing of Alpha Flight by John Byrne Omnibus. Omnibus. 
I know there are people that really like this. I remember at the time reading it, it's like he's not letting the team get together. They're a superhero team, but it's all solo stories. And then he killed off the one super interesting character, and it's like, yeah, I think I'm tapping out. Other people liked Alpha Flight, so I'm glad this is being printed for them. Uh, I think that is mostly it for me. Isn't that enough? Oh, we have Planet Hulk World Breaker. Yeah. Joe just finished Planet Hulk. This is a sequel that Greg Pak wrote recently. Yeah, I'll have to pick this up because I did not pick it up as a comic because I was reading it as it came out. There is also Spider-Man The Lost Hunt, which is a sequel to The Last Hunt that J.M.D. Matias did. This is uh, returns to uncover the origin of Craven the Hunter. In Craven's Last Hunt, the acclaimed writer delivered the definitive tale of one of Spider-Man's deadliest foes, now revealing secrets and answering mysteries Spidey fans have been waiting for. This is the story of what made Craven the man he is. This is also a tale set just after Spider-Man The Final Adventure when Peter Parker was powerless. Uh, there is a new X-Men trade, the X-Men Trials of X, Volume 11. I picked those up. They're the ones that reprint the current X-Men stuff in chronological order. Basically, here's the stories that you should read to know what's going on. And then the epic collections are pretty much... A lot of new printings. A new printing of the Spider-Man Epic Collection number 15. Daredevil Epic Collection number 13. Punisher Epic Collection Volume 2, which is the one you need to get. That's that's the best one because it's got the Punisher miniseries that at one point was worth gazillions of dollars. I don't know if it's still worth anything or not. And then, is there anything else that jumped out at me? Ah. Oh, you know the um, mini Marvel Masterworks? Yeah. Spider-Man is up to volume four, which is Spider-Man 29 through 38. So it is the final Ditko stories, including the Master Planner trilogy. And Joe's favorite, just a guy named Joe. I can't go wrong with that title. And that's it for Marvel. All right, back to the previews. Just think, Joe, we finally made it past Marvel at an hour and 18 minutes. I know. I, I know. And, and, oh, my God, look at what I got listed here. Oh, all right, jump right in. One on page 222. This is part of the deluxe publishers, and I'm going to jump into Titan. Mother Nature DM Edition. The only reason I'm mentioning this is because they're doing what I bitched about last month. An exclusive co-pick cover signed tipped in sheet by Jamie Lee Curtis. Wasn't that what I was complaining about? I said, hey, Titan, I'll buy this if you have Jamie Lee Curtis sign one. There you go. They, call, they called me out. I'm buying it. Um, the two pages before. Conan the Barbarian. The original comics, Omnibus Volume 2, and Savage Sword of Conan, the original comics, Omnibus Volume 2. Joe, I want you to look at those covers. What do you see on those covers that has uh, never been before? page 220 Ooh. and 221? It's never been on an Omnibus published by somebody not Marvel. Are you talking like Marvel comic covers? You see on the cover the Conan Comics Group, but they use the Marvel trade dress. Yeah, which is probably pretty common now because people do that as a variant quite a bit. Savage Dragon, I'm looking at you. But I want to point these out. If you missed the Conan omnibuses when Marvel did them, this is the exact same. It's the same film. These are reprints of the Marvel versions with the letters pages, with the introductions, all of it. It is a straight reprint of those books. Because when Marvel put them together, Marvel did not own them. They were owned by Conan Enterprises, Inc. Also, there is a trade paperback on the next page that I'm pointing out. Gun Honey, Blood for Blood, the direct market edition, written by Charles Eric. 
written by Charles Arday. I want to get that right. And drawn by Ang Har Kang. Uh, this was collected before, but this is direct. This is a direct market version with a specific cover limited to 750 comics. It's by Hard Case Crime. You know I'm going to buy it. Come on, man. Come on, man. I, I'm not because I already picked up the. Uh, you got the cover. regular cover. Yeah, I'm, I'm a I'm a snob that way. <laughs> I have this next one, but if you don't, you might want to pick it up. Page 254, Airship Entertainment, Myth Adventures, Collected Edition. Oh, yes, I have that. Oh, yeah. Robert Aspen, Phil Folio. Oz is a powerful wizard from another dimension who's been stripped of his magic. Skeeve is his untried apprentice. Together, they must stop a powerful madman who's determined to destroy the universe. It's a fast-paced, witty comic adaptation of the popular novels by award-winning author Robert Aspen. It's been long out of print. Finally remember it, you are not getting my copy, so here's your chance to get your own. At a pretty decent I, price. I love those novels. Absolutely oh. love those novels. Uh, yeah, it was a yeah. series of humorous fantasy novels. Joe, I think I've told you they are the reason I quit reading a lot of fantasy and science fiction series until they were done. I actually... Once upon a time, won a like a hundred dollar gift card for Dreamhaven, and when I went in to redeem it, I picked up all the Myth Adventures I could, the actual books, and uh, I have no idea if I have them, but uh, you know, cause like everything I buy, I tend to read it and flip it. But oh, and then the the graphic novel, the Phil Folio's art is just outstanding, so definitely worth pick up. Let's see what was that was on mine as well. Uh, over in Archie, number 266, Archie Giant Comics Charm. It is a 480 page collected edition, but also on the same page is another collection that is Archie Modern Comics Mania. This reprints a whole bunch of stories from t the 2020s. So it's a lot of the modern stuff they've been doing in the front of some of the digests and some of the one shots like the one on the next page where you know here's a nice collection digest size for current archie stuff and if you want to pick up current archie stuff the page before they're still doing one shots in the chilling adventure vein this time they're picking on little jinx a cursed life it's uh again if you if you're big on the the chilling adventure stuff. Here's your chance to pick one up for three ninety nine. All, Joe, horror, all horror one shot. We have hit an anniversary, Joe. We have. Yes. I didn't even and I'm not talking it. about us being 13 years old as a podcast. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, it was three years ago that we first recorded a podcast talking about how Avatar was no longer printing new books and just emptying out the, uh, the stuff in the warehouse. So for three years, you've been able to get the Avatar stuff. Five ninety five for their trade paperbacks. Oh yeah, yeah. And they're doing. They've still got four pages. No, six, <laughs> seven pages of stuff that they're still blowing out. They haven't printed a new book since. And yeah, how they're able to, how they're able to afford to keep buying pages because you have to buy your listing in previews. Someone probably got this stuff dirt cheap selling it. No, it's Avatar selling it. That's what I mean. It's, they probably are just, hey, you know, flunk it out. Let's get it out. I, wa I do want to point out that there was a new Archie comic as well on page 267. Betty and Veronica, Friends Forever, Game On, which features an all-new lead story. The reason I mention it is because Sabrina, the teenage witch, oh, I love her. She joins Betty and Veronica and the gang for some fun at Riverdale Arcade. So, and that that's only a mere two ninety nine. So Ooh. I'll pick that bad boy up. By the way, same as uh, Avatar, Boundless Press, which is owned by Avatar. Yeah, they, they're they still selling off a whole shit ton of Lady Death special covers oh, on yeah. page 290 and 291. I think by this point, if you haven't bought them yet, you just don't care because they've been in previews for three years. Page 269 has a $1 comic from Aspen, Charismatic your chance to try it out for a buck which i always recommend 
I was up to the next one. It's like, oh, I have a bunch of, because I dog ear the uh, corners of the books I want to talk about. Oh, cool. I got a whole bunch here. Oh, it's Dark Horse. We've already done that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've, I've got a few coming up. Let me let me bang a few of these out because I, oh, I would just some about this previews just got me going because there was just so much fun stuff. Like on page 280, the Gatsby original graphic novel, we talked about it. I believe it was a, was this the one that was a series or was it somebody else? No, this is different. This is, oh, that, that was an adaptation. This is a new story about the great Gatsby. Yeah. Yeah. Original graphic novel from AWA. So check it out. You know, if you're a Gatsby fan, it could be of interest to you. I just thought that that was weird. Uh, ah, Fantagraphics is on page 316. All right, let's see. What do you what are you getting on 316? Well, first we have two new issues of Red Room, which is a unbelievably creepy horror comic, which actually made me feel. <laughs> you know, most horror comics are like, oh, okay, okay. Red Room by Ed Pisker. You 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 end that book and you're like you you don't feel good you feel creeped out <laughs> it is a very effective horror comic and I think that was it that they had for fanographics underneath yeah that it, was all they had I'm I'm going for and I don't know if I can pronounce this right Anisus Din a Sea of Lies it's a prize winning impressionist graphical graphic biography. It traces the life affairs and artist process of Aeneas Nin, one of the best known authors of women erotica in the 1920s and 30s, patron saint of taboo breaking sexual inoclasts, the cartoonists, another name, Leon Bischoff, that wasn't too bad, begins with Nin living within the partisan suburbs. Soon her obsession with June Miller leads her to recount her many sexual liaisons, including those with Henry Miller, topic of cancer, her psychoanalyst, and even her father. Although Bischoff's drawing are largely representational, she occasionally depicts Nin's sexual experiences as scenes as surreal as Nin's own written portrayal of them. And yeah, I look at I always look at fanographics because there's always something interesting uh, just to check out to see what they got. Back on page 284 from Band of Bards, Tales from the Pandemic. It's a one shot, an anthology of eight stories to mark the third anniversary of the COVID-19 pandemic. While the world continues to try to make sense of these events, an extraordinary group of comic creators tell their tales and attempt to express their feelings and experiences. On the page across from it, two books, the Grand Slam, well, only two books, but uh, home runs on both of them, Black Dog and Leventhal have impossible people. A graphic novel, oh, I hope you're rich. In her keenly observed graphic memoir, celebrated cartoonist Julia Wirtz chronicles her haphazard attempts at sobriety in the relentlessly challenging and surprisingly funny and occasionally observed cycle of addiction and recovery. Uh, opening at the culmination of a disastrous trip to Puerto Rico, Julia stands middle of the jungle besides a rental jeep she's just crashed from this moment the story flashes back to the beginning of her five-year journey towards sobriety underneath it from black panel press the amazing camel toe from claire duplan constance a modern young illustrator takes revenge on the thousands of attacks suffered daily by women with a comic of her own titled The Amazing Camel Toe, celebrating the adventures of the anti-macho vigilante in tight panther leggings, a hero who battles against sexism, harassment, slut-shaming, and unrealistic standards of beauty. Again, another graphic novel. Both these have the logo of the month, Women in Comics. So, but hey, how could you not, yeah. Uh, could you give me the amazing camel toe? And whoever laughs, smack them. Page 328 is a book that you and I have known about for quite a while. And I was surprised that it came out and I hadn't seen it. But here it is in previews. Captain America, the Ghost Army. Written by Alan Grants and drawn by local artist. And uh, I 
we're buds, we're pals, Brent Schoonover. Yeah. In this thrilling historical adventure set during World War II, Steve Rogers and Bucky Barnes encounter a threat like they've never seen, a ghost army. The dead of the wars and wars past are coming back to life, impervious to bullets, flames, or anything else the Allies can throw at them. It is a digest size, 176 pages. Brent's a hell of a guy, and he has been all over the place pushing this book. He's very proud of it, and I'm glad I'm finally able to buy a copy of it. Page 286, Destiny, New York. My girlfriend broke up with me, and so now I ruin the mystical mafia. Number one. Gotta love these titles. <laughs> Little Aberdeen is the last surviving daughter of a mystical crime family. She has spent her whole life running from the past, but now those whole demons are finally catching up to her. She thought she was meant to be with former prophecy girl Logan McBride, but life has pulled them apart. There's a couple of pages there. Uh, across from them, also from Black Studio. Don't avert your eyes, number one. There's nothing there, comic. The story that launched Reno into the 1970s, it's an erotic horror series. Also launched Maria Lovett and Patrick Kildon into the American comic market. Now, five years later, they're returning to the world of There's Nothing There with new collaborators. Valentina Bentini from Vampire Slayer, Buffy Vampire Slayer, Simone Salencia. The gist of it, celebrity socialite Reno Saletti doesn't believe very much beyond Instagram comments, hipster drugs, and the flash of paparazzi cameras. So when a friend invites her to an eyes wide shut type party, she goes along mostly for the lots. However, the joke doesn't feel funny when she realizes it's an actual occult ritual. Suddenly she's seeing things. Horrifying apparitions trying to warn her to run. Now, it's adults only, limited to 5,000. So if you're really going to be interested, buy one. Otherwise, buy two. And if I get an extra, I'll sell it to you. See, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a reasonable guy. Now, Joe's been talking about a bunch of books. I, I have my, you know, my love of the big books. Corey Joe, likes to, big books. Go to page 355. 355. Carl Barks Comics and Stories Original Art Edition Hardcover. Oh, yeah. Now, normally these original art editions are 200 bucks. This one's you only realize, a you, you realize This one's you said, only 100. You said addictions. <laughs> Freudian slip, perhaps? Yeah, it is. Uh, no, no. Uh, this, this volume prints nine complete Carl Barks stories in the original full size they were originally drawn in glorious black and white their happy hound who, are, who ended up being droopy uh benny burrow and four stories of the combined barney bear and benny burrow feature this book is 14 inches wide 20 inches tall weighs over five pounds uh looking at these pages as they are printed in this book is like looking at the pages fresh from the master's drawing board. These early stories from 1943 are printed one page to the page in the book with an image size of about 12.5 by 17.75 inches. The size Barks drew his original art in 1942 and 1943. These pages are printed from proofs that are derived from the seven by 10 inch photo negatives taken of the original art between 1943 and 1947. Looking at the stories in this book is like looking at pages of Barks original art because Barks didn't make any correct, didn't make many mistakes that needed corrections to his art. The main use of white ink was not to correct errors, but to delineate details on the black on black images and to add cuts pie cuts to the duck's eyes. So oh, I've seen a lot of these, you know, books that they they reprint the original art at the original size, et cetera, et cetera. This one again, 108 pages for a hundred bucks. Normally these are two hundred bucks. Matter of fact, if you go back, graffiti is still trying to empty out their warehouse. So if you want any of those, they are still available and your comic shop can give you the prices. What page is that? Page 326 and 27. So they still have Sandman, Ronan, Dark Knight, uh, Sandman Overture, League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, 
and the uh, Kelly Jones Batman stuff. Uh, if I can fit this into my budget, I'm buying it. If just not, what I need. Just what I need. More. Go back to 269. I'm sorry, 292. Under Shex Publishing, Astro and Inez, a La Novella One Shot. It's a durable misadventure of Astro, a troublemaking pup, and his human, Inez. I thought Astro, it, I thought Astro's boy was Elroy. Nope, nope. This is just a. This is pre. This is when he's a little pup because he has oh. no sense of boundaries. As impatient gets Inez into all kinds of shenanigans. Inez is a hopeless romantic with a slightly dramatic personality. She'll play bingo with your sweet Abdulida, then whine about how she was hustled. It's uh, two different covers to buy, same price. Across from it on page 293, again, a couple more graphic novels. First one from Clarion Books, 83 Days in Maripool, a war diary. Yeah, this is dealing with the Ukrainian city being invaded, early target of Russia's invasion of the Ukraine. It's, it's a war diary. Again, it's it's written by someone who was there, so I'm real interested to see how that. Underneath it, the do-over, volume one. Friendships and creativity come together when three girls open their own styling studio in this new graphic series that's perfect for fans of Click and Smile, which I have no idea what it is. Let's see, Shy Mariana is looking for her chance to shine. She's having trouble making friends. Her dad refuses to help out at his hair salon. Sorry, dad refuses to let her help out, despite the fact that she's a social media expert. So she meets a couple kids, Zoe, Creative Maverick, Everly. The three decide to start their own hairstyling studio. And it just uh, she loves helping her fellow middle school clients express themselves when the town's harvest fest on the horizon. Line of customer always at the door. Friends have to scale up quickly. They don't always agree on how. Soft cover, hard cover option, which I always find interesting. And uh, that was just something caught my eye. I thought was interesting. Corey? On page 389, we got a few things. Now, one is a battle action. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Here's my problem with it, Joe. Okay. 32 pages for eight bucks. Mm. That's a rough. That's a rough buy for me. So I'm going to kind of, I haven't decided yet. But on that same page is the third volume in the best of 2000 AD. You could also get volumes one and two. 2000 AD is the British weekly comic that's been going since 1977 and is still being printed. It was where basically it was the British comics revolution. So uh, Judge Dredd, Zenith, Robusters, ABC Warriors. It's where Alan Moore came from. It's where it, it, pretty much everybody except for Neil Gaiman in the British invasion of the early 80s came from. So this is uh, best of to kind of introduce people to their long history. Also on the next page is the Judge Dredd Complete Case Files number 19. Cool. So I like, and these are by Mark Miller, by the way. These are uh, Mark Miller Judge Dredd stories, which I've never read before. On Joe. page 297 from Conundrum Press, Adherent by Chris W. Kim, the res another graphic novel. The residents of an isolated village in a dreamlike world scavenge for supplies in the surrounding forest, collecting scattered items left over from a time long past. No one stays far, strays far from this community, fearing what may lay beyond it. When they find a stack of notebooks by an unknown author, a young villager becomes obsessed with their contents. She sets out on a quest to find the writer. As she ventures out into the unknown, she discovers a world both barren and increasingly complex. The closer she gets to her goal, the more she realizes the encounter she's been seeking probably won't be what she wanted. From there, jump to page 203. I'm sorry, 203. 302303 303 from Dead Good Comics. Albertania in the Underground, Full Tilt Boogie. I gotta love the titles these guys are coming up with. Uh, back, they had Octobrina with Love, which was an all star prestige one shot they're offering again. This is from the 50th anniversary edition. 
Octobrina and the Underground are back. There's two tales. GameSpot and Giant Bomb's Lucy James makes their comic writing debut, Doxing Max, throwing the Underground into a madcap VR metaverse featuring eye-popping art from Simone Regazzoni, who you've probably seen from Power Ranger Universe. So, and another one, Stu Taylor and N. Stephen Harris take a trip back to the 1970s in God Hates a Coward. A simple heist mission hits a snag when the underground collide with combined machinations of Baba Yaga, Sister Disturbia, and the best that the Soviet Red Army has to offer, Mother Russia. So you got a bunch of covers to choose from, a little bit of art, some stuff, uh, again, not graphic novel expensive, but something to check out. Corey? Uh, the rest of what I have is the regular stuff. We have a new issue, a back issue, new issue of comic book artist, and a new issue of Jack Kirby Collector in tomorrow's. And anytime I get a new Jack Kirby Collector, I'm a very happy man. That's All it right. for me on comics. Holy crap. I'm only in the Ds. All right, folks, sit back. We're going fast and furious here. Tron and Quarterly have a couple. There's a new printing of a book called Hitler Graphic Novel. 70 years after his death, Adolf Hitler remains a mystery. The manga ka delves deep into the history books. It's, it's done by Shigrio Mitsuki. Delves deep into the history books to create an absorbing and eloquent portrayal of Hitler's life. Again, a graphic novel. Drawn and Quarterly usually have some good stuff. Speaking of which, you've got... Oh, where is it? Where is it? Melody, the story of a nude dancer. I've I read never, that years ago when it came out. I'm never going to be a nude dancer. So this is my chance to find out what it'd be like. In 1980, Sylvia Rancourt, the writer, artist, cover artist, and her boyfriend moved to Montreal from rural northern Quebec. With limited formal education or training, they had a hard time finding employment. So she began dancing in strip clubs. These experiences formed the background of her first Canadian autobiographical comic, Melody. And let's see, these are written and drawn comics. I've never before seen English publication. Although this, this may be off. Well, it says it's an essential item. So I don't know if this is a new one. No, it's a new, a, new okay, new printing. Okay, okay. And that would be the same thing across from it. Make Me a Woman by Vanessa Davis. It's an easy to understand why Vanessa Davis has taken the comic industry by storm. Her comics are pure chutzpah, gorgeously illustrated in watercolors. No story is too painful to tell, like how much she enjoyed her fat cramp. She enjoyed fat camp, nor off limits, like her critique of Robert Crumb, nor too personal, like her stories of growing up Jewish in Florida. Using her sweet but biting wit, Davis effortlessly carves out a whole new original and refreshing niche in two well-worn territories, autobiographical comics and Jewish identity. So three threes from uh, Drawn and Quarterly. Take a breath on page 308. Hey, if you uh, got the money, there's Amazing Spider-Man signed by uh, Gary Conway, 199. That is, it's a facsimile of Spider-Man 129, but I'm telling you, Gary Conway signatures are hard to find that come with a COA, so that might be one worth picking up. On page 314, dun, 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 Far South. This is from Fair Square Comics. Far South, crooks, pimps, and gachos. It's an arid and wild land cut off from the world. Tough and hot-blooded men, crime, alcohol, revenge. This is where the Tecturn Montoya runs a bar a bar where the worst scoundrels in the area come to settle the difference or to talk about their setbacks. What happens in far south stays in far south. Just, hey, I've always wanted to run a bar. Here's my chance to give it a shot. On page 319, I'll give you a minute to catch up. Books of Clash, volume one, legendary achievery. It's based on the global hit Clash of Clans. I'm just mentioning it because if you know what Clash of Clans is, here's your chance to pick it up. No idea, but it's it's a global hit. Soft cover, hard cover options, so very, very cool. Page 231, Joe Jusco's Art of the 1991 Marvel Masterworks hardcover. Oh, man, beautiful art. 
you can go with the regular or the signed hardcover. I believe I kickstarted this one. So obviously that's a sign it's coming because a lot of times they'll advertise on in previews just to get keep things going. So here's your chance. Just enjoy the art or, you know, because it would be larger than trading cards. I will have all 104 of the paintings Joe produced for the, the card set, as well as 20 additional paintings created for the four issue comic collection, which you can find if you're lucky enough to run into it. Page 379. 379. I don't uh, dog ear my corners, but what I do is I have a notebook and I write everything. I do, I do two things. I write things I want to point out. And then in my other notebook, I write down things I'm going to buy. Things I point out, there's a lot of things with question marks. Cause like I said, there's a lot of freaking uh, graphic novels coming out. In this case, under Oni, page 379, Blink. When Brooker was three, she found she was found alone and covered in blood on the streets of New York. Since that day, she's been haunted by the childhood she can't remember. Until decades later, she finds a cryptic website streaming multiple CCT feeds from strange rooms in a ruined building. Something clicks, setting off hitting memories that leads her back to a place she's been Seeing in lifelong nightmares, hunting for answers, Ren breaks in and finds herself lost in a camera-filled dark mazes of a decayed social experiment known only as Link. Oh, by the way, it's not abandoned at all. So that sounds creepy as living hell. I'll, I'll give it a shot. Page 380, same on here. Memoir, Memento Morny Softcover. It's a Finnish graphic novel, Titu Takalo. Chronicles her sudden unexpected cerebral hemorrhage and the long road to recover she had to travel. This hits me the same way Harvey Picard's Our Cancer Year does. It's, I, I, God forbid anybody we're listening to or anybody you know has a cerebral hemorrhage, but it, it's always something you hear about, horrifying, but here's your chance. Get some knowledge of what happened when I read our cancer year, I not that I want to get cancer, but I kind of get an idea. I think what it, what did Harvey do? He he rushed his chemotherapy versus doing over a long time, and it well, you can go read that because both these books are crazy, true life health stories, and uh, that's you know other than if you've lived through it and you got my sympathy. Uh, this is probably a, a good way to get some information. Back to some fantasy. Let's go to 380, 381, right across the street from uh, the book I just mentioned, Knee Deep Book One. 200 years in the future, survivors of an environmental cataclysmic cataclysm took refuge underground. Their descendants now live in a literal sewer, the bowels of a subterranean city an abandoned future utopia that was never completed. These sewer folk, collection of scavengers, mitzvahs, bandits, podcasters, renegades, mutants, they eke out a living in this underground maze of tunnels and canals. Life's hard enough, but then an overzealous mining company, Perch, wants to get their claws on this new underground frontier and they won't hesitate to bulldoze any sewer folk that get in their way. Caught in the middle is Cricket, young girl desperately searching for her family that fled underground. This joins the savage new world. Cricket joins and explores the savage new world to find her parents and lock the secrets. Again, another graphic novel. I hope you guys rich because. Oh. See, where are we now? Well, we we hope you're rich because you're the one ordering all this. stuff. I didn't say I'm ordering. These are ones I, I got to tell you, Marvel DC didn't really have a lot. And when I'm reading these, I'm like, these just sound fascinating. And again, if if I don't know, okay, let's go something cheap. How about uh, let's see, page 282. Oh, I'm sorry, to page 283. We're in Opus Comics Within Temptation, number one, three issue miniseries for six dollars and 66 cents. In the distant future, an endless battle rages between two species an advanced but inherently humanoid species ruled by techno organic matrix on one side and a cruel race of alien artificial intelligence on the other. Several stories collide to paint a sweeping portrait of the matriarch's life and her struggle to balance what she was created to do and be with impossible forces that shape her. 
It's based on the smash hit album Resist by legendary uh, symphonic metal band Within Temptation. Only three issues, too. So let's see. Same page. Blood of the Virgin hardcover from Pantheon Books. Set in and around 1971 Los Angeles, Blood of Virgin follows an immigrant film editor named Seymour who's desperate to make his own movies. With no money, no clout, he has no choice but to spend his days slumming it. For worst and most exploitative production company in town, he's given a chance to make a film as his own. His unbending principles, relentless drive, violently clash with an industry that rewards everything but these traits. <sighs> Another graphic novel. I told you it's a, it's a. I've never had this many graphic novels that caught my attention. <laughs> Page three eighty four. Bandita Dominica, superhero. Bandita is the Dominica gunslinger from New York. When Bandita hears about Broadway theater gang taking advantage of the talent, she tries out for them and lands a job as custodian. And she befriends Chain, a new lead singer, and learns about the Centifocos. Centificos? And their abusive ways. On opening night, Bandita faces off against the boss. Luna Loca. So that's from Phoenix Studio. Okay, let's pop forward 388. Under, actually, I think, no, you talked about that one. Battle action. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we talked about that. Across on any other page is a hundred, when, did you talk about 10,000 Disasters of Dort? I did not. I. This is from Rebellion to 2000 AD. Aliens from Dort have lost their world and now they want Earth. It is the year 2000. In 50 years' time, the planet Dort will, will collide with the sun and be destroyed. Rada, the director of Dort, has chosen Earth as a new home for his people. But first, he is creating 10,000 disasters to wipe out human life. Not as expensive, $16.99 for 80 pages, but again, it has the same thing with battle action. Sounds good, but... Uh, Let's see, page 390. We are Scarlet Twilight. This is from, oh, we're still from Rebellion. 1938 this time, Tan to meet our hero, Captain Lancet. It's golden age, all American crime buster is about to accidentally create the world's greatest villain. He needs to adjust to a strange new world, one that resembles Fritz Lang's Metropolis with some cyberpunk dystopia sprinkled in if he wants to overthrow the totalitarian vampire cult that now dominates the world. It's just a regular comic, so you can afford it. Let's see, where are we here? Page 392. George's Run, a writer's journey through Twilight Zone. This George Clayton Johnson wrote, co-wrote the screenplay for Ocean's Eleven, he did Logan's Run, classic scripts for Star Trek, Twilight Zone. Late in life, Johnson befriended comic journalist and artist Henry Chamberlain, the gentleman who wrote the story. The two had long chats about his amazing life and career. Now Chamberlain pays tribute to his late friend in the graphic novel, George's Run. Again, kind of a playoff Logan's Run. So I'm interested in that because I love Logan's Run. I love... George Clayton Johnson, and I just, I'm really curious to see uh, about this. Across from it, page 393, Possible Jones and Captain Lightning. This is a comic book, special crossover featuring Carl, Carl Kessel. Kessel. Yep, and Tom Grummet's Investigation of the Unknown, Section Zero. It's Carl Kessel, what else do you need to know? And again, if you, if you, well, I'm going to, I'm trying to flip these, these quick because, uh, like I said, I hope I hit the lottery in the next couple of days. 396, <laughs> quicksand. Sometimes I can't even read what I'm writing. 396? Oh, there, no, I'm sorry, 395. Uh, comic from, oh, no, I got to back up. Dun, 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 dun. Oh, this is Scout Comics. This is a, a one, I don't know if it's a one shot or not, but Quicksand number one, 
page 395, their mysterious hole opens in the Egyptian desert. Horrific creatures climb out and wreak havoc on a nearby city. They retreat as quickly as they arrive, leaving the planet in shock by this unfathomable event. A team of elite specialists from around the globe called Canary One are sent after the monsters to discover more about them. But when the crew never returns, the world must prepare for possibility of another wave of attacks. And across from that is Sudden Death Number One. Again, a comic. Hank Kelly cannot die. With this revelation, he is catapulted into a world of fame and fortune that he hopes will repair his broken family. But Detective Rosalind Lovejoy's works to unravel the dark mystery behind Hank's immortality. All right, pop to page 408. We are in Sumerian Comics Feeder. It's a, let's see, Lead Kid was the most famous action movie hero of the 80s, but he's fallen on hard times with his life in a downward spiral. Kid has become a shadow of his former self, turning to a life of crime as an enforcer for a local crime boss. But when he's given a new job, can he bring himself to complete it? Or is he being given a chance to change his ways? A couple different photo covers, including a movie homage, because you'll be back. Page 412. Let's see. Old Gods and New, a companion to Jack Kirby's Fourth World. Corey, do you have this one? Yes, that was a special issue of the Jack Kirby Quarterly or Jack Kirby Companion that kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger until they just said, "No, nah, it's a book." It's a reference book. Yeah, six. Yeah, this actually sounds really, really cool. It's and, it's a great reference book with your new gods. Yeah, which I so, could probably use because half the time I'm texting Corey, "Ah, uh, what's going on?" <laughs> I'm, I'm starting to figure it out. So yeah, I definitely. This is one of those again. It's, I got the big question mark on it because it's an essential item, which means I could probably order it again. But I also got a, because underneath it from Civilized Books, there's Damnation Diaries, another graphic novel. Hell can get you down. It's a big, hot, often painful place, hard place to get creative projects done. But something else is bothering inmate PKR X354, something beyond the unrelenting and often observed torture routines. The demons or the tormenting of his mother, father, girlfriend, who also consigned the underworld. Luckily, there's help. Fred Greenberg, Hill's only psychotherapist. That got me right there. <laughs> it's comedy, horror, whatever. It just, I, I, I tell you, you know, half the time I read these things and I think, you know what? These could be good shows, but the way everybody's cutting back on streaming, it's probably not going to happen. So pick it up as a graphic novel. Page 423. One, two, three, four, five, five to go. So wake up. Under vault, heavy. This is a trade paperback. Bill may be dead, but he's got a job to do. I might buy this for my brother-in-law, Bill. Welcome to the big wait. Here are folks who don't quite make the cut go to work off their debt. Everybody in the wait's got a job. Bill is a heavy whose job is policing the multiverse, making sure bad eggs get what's coming to them. He's on track to earn his climb and reunite with the woman he loves till he meets his new partner, the worst dude of all time. Heavy is the punisher for neurotics. Inception for the impatient. Preacher for, well, it's a lot like Preacher. Macbeam is, Macbeam is from Moon Knight. He brings you a story about the existential purpose of dumb boys with big guns. Page 426. A new series from What Not Publishing, The North Valley Grim Noir. Across from it, tons of different various covers. Mark, DC Comics' Sean Gordon Murphy makes his What Not Publishing debut. It's a thrilling debut. A CA Black Ops division clandestinely hunts and eliminates the most dangerous threat in history. Magic. That's with a K. On a routine assignment, Agent Malik discovers a Grim Noir more powerful than a nuclear weapon. But when the agency wants to recover it, the spellbook, instead of destroying it, he begins to question their end game. Yeah, this, this one looks good. And it's a series and it's a comic, so it's not expensive. All right, number three as the countdown continues. Do, I was, do, oh do, no, do, it's the next page. Do, do, do. No, 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 save the music. 
434 is Z Comics, and they're offering uh, the Legend of Baby Metal soft cover. Again. I yeah, I don't know if you have it. And then underneath it is Puppy Genesis Volume 1. So if you're into those bands, definitely pick those up. Into the manga, page 452, and Corey's already talked about it, Street Fighter. I don't care, but you can look at it, different covers. I know in the past I've been able to score some of the foil variants and, of course, some of the women fighters and sell them. But what's interesting here is the comics 1, 2, 3, and 4 are all solicited at once. So you definitely want to pick that up. And finally, lest you think this is all about me, the best title ever on page 466. My instant death ability is so overpowered, no one in this other world stands a chance against me. Basically, Yogiri Takuto's school trip is plunged into chaos when his class transports to another dimension. Having missed his chance to be gifted fabulous powers, it seems he has no choice but to settle for his existing secret ability to invoke instant death with a single thought. So it is my hope in the future we're going to get my buddy Turbo to come on and talk because this guy knows his manga. When he went with me last week and we were dropping off flyers to all the comic stores in town, he he basically hates me because he's just been picking a manga like crazy. But he, <laughs> he refers it and he knows it. And we've always, that's has always been a blank spot for us because Corey and I, we didn't all have the time unless it's something we know. Turbo knows the manga. He knows the anime. So I told him, we're gonna, you got to get together and just write up a quick two, three minute blurb and we'll dump it as a special segment. <sighs> I'm going to take a drink. And while you do that, Flip over your book, because now it's for Brian. What, you got anything for Brian this month, Corey? I do. Ooh. It's a Funko Pop of one of the weirdest damn characters they ever had at DC. And I've only read one story with it, because, you know, I... I started reading DC in 1982. So a lot of their goofy characters were either phased out or completely reinvented. But there's one they have not brought back, and I'm kind of surprised, and that is on page 28. Composite Superman. Half <laughs> Superman, half Batman. <laughs> the powerful DC villain is shapeshifted into a half Man of Steel, half Great Crusader. But his green skin gives him away as the imposter he is. I the the character was just goofy. Just <laughs> and they brought him back in some of the last issues of World Finest, written by David Kraft, and he he excelled at writing goofy characters. And DC has a lot of just whacked out, messed up stuff. Composite Superman was one of those whacked out messed up characters but just look at that design that's something you put on your desk and people will go what the hell is that well if if if, you, if that's not quite your thing brian uh page 24 25 a couple of interesting ones if you're a funko fan you always got to look in the previews because previews has their own exclusive the they got nightcrawler there well I, I don't recommend buying that underneath it pop art cover brandalize flying balloon girl cased figure and underneath that is a tagging robot case final figure. Uh, yeah, put that on your desk and let people look at it. Me, I'm, I'm, I might buy that uh, Pop DC Heroes Shazam comic cover vinyl figure. You know, where they got that. It's not the first Wiz or even the Shazam, but it's the first meeting in the, uh, I don't know if this was Silver Age or Current Age or what a Bronze Age maybe. Uh, behind it, you see Captain Marvel and Superman. Coming at it head to head, so I've been liking some of these. Even Tony Isabella yeah, gave it a. That's buck. a bronze. That's a Bronze Age cover. Bronze Age, yeah, yeah, that's pretty sweet. Anything else for Brian? That's enough. No, no, no. There's always something. Like on page 34, Brian, you need to get Animaniac Reaction Wave One figures. You got Wacko, 
Gecko and Dot, as well as Mr. Uh, uh, Scratch and Sniff. Dr. Scratch and Sniff. And if that's not enough, you can go back to page 32 and get yourself an Elton John Live in 1976, eight inch clothed figure from NECA. In partnership with Sir Elton John, they produce a second deluxe tribute of the legend. But I know, I know what Brian's going for. Corey, back on page 31, you know Brian's going to want to build a chud. So he's going to pick up all these figures just so he can build himself a chud. Hmm. You know what else he should get? Uh, is, is that enough? He should get some internet safety from our sponsors. Our newest sponsor is NordVPN. Let's be honest, if you're out on the internet, you need a VPN to protect you. There's all sorts of things going on on the internet where people can track you. You could accidentally download a keylogger, uh, all sorts of things. NordVPN gives the best security possible. It has a password manager, which generates complex passwords, syncs across all your devices, stores your notes and credit card information. It also gives you 10 gigabytes of private cloud storage, um, secure files that backs up your data automatically. But the main thing it gives you is peace of mind. It gives you peace of mind when you're um, out on the internet, when you're streaming, when you're playing games, when you're listening to podcasts like this one. It gives you safety anywhere at any time. It protects your online activity. You get full access to all content. And if you use the link, go.nordvpn.net sh3ku, it'll take you to where you can get a great deal for a one month plan, a two year plan, a one year plan. They are our newest sponsor. We're happy to have them. And if you would like to sponsor something here at any of the podcasts on the Solitaire Rose Network, you can just email me, Solitaire Rose Network at gmail.com. Thanks. Woo. And you should listen to all these podcasts. The Solitaire Rose Radio Network is currently on a pause, basically because COVID 19 has made it so that uh, I have to work. A lot of extra hours at both jobs, but you can still go and listen to my other podcasts. Now, you're probably listening to Crazy Comics and Stories, which is the main podcast, but on this same feed, K R A Y Z C O M I X, is Solitaire Rose Radio, the solo radio podcast that I do. Um, I've done interviews, I've done short stories, I've done all sorts of things, and you can get to it right here on this same feed. I also do a podcast called Novelcast, where I take the novels I've written and turn them into free audiobooks. That's over at novels.solitairerose.com. Dangerous Dan Moore and I, and of course Wolfie Be Bad, give you bad advice over at badadvice.solitairerose.com. You send in your questions, and we give you the aforementioned bad advice. And then myself and Adam Vermillion from For the Love of Comics, do the Fantastic Forecast at fantasticforecast.solitairerose.com where we go through the issues of the Fantastic Four, four issues at a time, to give the plot and commentary on each issue. That's not all. Yes, I'm crazy. I still, over at pwinsiderelite.com, every week on Wednesday, do a recap of the latest episode of AEW Dynamite. I write up what happened, and then myself and Anthony Pyrus will do an audio. Now, you can only listen to the audio if you're a member at pwinsiderelite.com, and if you're a wrestling fan, you should be, where we then break down the episode, talk about what we liked, what we didn't like, give it a grade, and let you know if you should have watched that episode. Those are the other podcasts here at the Solitaire Rose Radio Network. Thanks where you're not being told to buy 3,000 graphic novels. We are over two hours. Yeah, my bad. I regret the error. Not really. There's some damn so, fine stuff being offered there. So we're going to do one freaking okay. and one geeking. Joe, what are you freaking on? I'm trying to think of how to say this. I've got progressive diseases, rheumatoid arthritis, 
diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol. These, a lot of these are things that can be controlled. Diabetes is going to win eventually. That's why it's a progressive disease. So after all these months of being good, my diabetic numbers and my cholesterol number, go figure, went bad. So I do it. You go and talk to the doctor. There's new drugs out there. I'm on the new drugs. I'm actually feeling better because what I didn't realize was, you know, my eyes were fuzzy. I was just headachey, lethargic. So whatever the new diabetic meds he gave me, and I'm not on insulin yet. He's saving that and doesn't work. And I, again, and my diabetic monitor is broke and I don't have one, but I'm actually feeling a little better. But it was kind of depressing. You know, I go in, I give my blood, which was painless. Thank God. You go look at your numbers online and you realize. I've already sworn once shit and fucker. <laughs> it's gone up. You know, the AC one's HA one, whatever. You know, you diabetics know what I'm talking about. So I was a little bummed about that. You start getting to brown. Jeez. What the hell? I, my diet really hasn't changed. So anyways, I'm feeling much better now. Corey, what you freaking on? I covered the AEW Rampage pay-per-view last night. And if you've listened to the show long enough, you know that my first my first real big assignment at PW Insider was WrestleMania weekend where I was the low man on the totem pole, so I got to cover all of the death matches. Now, a death match in wrestling, there are two types of death matches. There are the type that the old territories used to do, which were basically just no holds barred matches and you fought until the somebody could not, you know, they were almost like a last man standing match till someone couldn't answer. But after ECW, there was a new type of death match, which is we're just gonna use weapons and weapons and blood and blood and weapons and blood and weapons and blood. So they had John Moxley who bleeds all the time and now doesn't even bother to hide the fact that he blades. He's bladed more times on camera than I think uh, Nick Bockwinkel bladed, period. Versus Adam Page, who he bleeds a lot too. And one of the things that they talk about one of the insults in wrestling is that you're a spot monkey, which means your stories don't your your matches don't have any flow. It's OK, we're going to do this spot. All right. Now we go and we do this spot. And by spot, it's like, OK, I'm going to leap over the top rope and land on you. And then I'm going to go up to the top rope and do uh, Hurricane Rana. And then I'm going to do this. And it, there's no flow to it. It's just, okay, we do this spot, then we move and we do this spot, and then we move and we do this spot, and then we move and we do this spot. And if you watch a good match, things have a reason. You know, the baby face comes out and he takes control early in the match, but the heel does something dastardly, and then he beats down the baby face for a while. And the way that they work the match is, okay, the baby face is trying to get revenge, but the heel knows the only way he can win is if the baby face can't do their their finishing maneuver that they need their leg for so the heel's going to do all sorts of terrible things to their leg etc etc the match with john moxley and adam page they were bleeding before the bell even rang and they used barbed wire wrapped chairs and they brought in bricks and i one of the spots was john moxley just took the brick and slammed it into uh, Adam Page's face. You know, it wasn't a move. It wasn't anything. It was just, oh, I'm just going to hit you in the head with a brick. And it went through this and it went for over 15 minutes and they were bleeding constantly the whole time. And after three minutes, it was, it was very much, if I didn't have to cover the match, I wouldn't have watched it. There was no need for that on a, on the number one, two wrestling company in the, in the world, basically, to have this indie shit mud show, blood match, then in the end, didn't make it either guy look any tougher, didn't make either of them look any better. At the end of it, it was just, okay, it's over, thank God. 
And I wish, and John Moxley does this so much now that I'm wondering if the insult punk threw at him, which is, you were always the third best person on whatever team you created, is true. I'm starting to think he can't wrestle. He just bleeds because he knows he can't wrestle, so he bleeds. Joe, what are you geeking on? I I, I have no clue. I'm going on vacation next week, so I'm pretty much checked out already. Um, I will mention, you know, I talked about in the past, I was kind of disappointed because through no fault of anybody, at least between the shipper and me, I ordered an Incredible Hulk 181 Wizard Ace Edition that was remarked with two head sketches by Herb Trimp. Because, you know, I'm going on an incredible binge on signed comics and stuff. And uh, it showed up. And I've I've reached out to the buyer and I'm like, hey, I know you refunded me, but did you get like when I ship things overseas, eBay protects me. So, right. Oh, I don't. Oh, it kills me because I had this huge order of the high end books from Dynamite of Red Sonia shipped to a guy and they. The freaking postal guys like, yeah, no, your address ain't right. I got to send it back. And it disappeared. I don't know if eBay got it. I don't know if the customs sat on it. I don't know if, you know, somebody ripped. Hey, look, a coloring book. Cool. But I told the guy, go ahead and make a report on it. eBay refunded him. They didn't take it from me. I wasn't given negative. I don't know if that happened with this guy, but I will find out. I get, Actually, let me see if he's replied. I sent the message right before the podcast. But they're like, I mean, this is like 9 p.m. at night for us, so they're probably way in the a.m. So but I'm happy to get it. I'm happy. If he gets screwed, I'm happy to figure out a way to get him the money because it looks so freaking cool. And like I said, when I get down to uh, uh, we're heading south, it's going to be a little along the uh, panhandle of Florida. Not going to be as warm as we hoped, but there's like five comic stores to visit, so I'm good. Corey, how about you? What you uh, geeking on? Also on last night's show, it was an hour long, what they call an Iron Man match, which is basically they're going to wrestle for an hour and whoever has the most pins or victories at the end of the hour wins between MJF and Brian Danielson. Now, Brian Danielson has done mo- enormous numbers of one hour matches. I even saw one at the St. Paul Armory between him and Samoa Joe. And it's not, you know, he's, he knows how to do that style of match. Now, everybody talks about the first hour long Iron Man match they remember, which was Shawn Michaels and Bret Hart at WrestleMania years and years and years ago. And when you go back and watch it, because all the, the um, suspense is taken out, you watch it and it's just not a really good match. The match they had last night, not only did I love it, not only did my co-host Anthony Pyrus love it, but Mike Johnson of PW Insider said that bell to bell, it was the best match AEW has ever had. And it's the best Iron Man match he's seen in 20 years. I'll go one further. It's the best Iron Man match I've ever seen in my life. They took you on a ride. They, it, it was a n- they did different styles so that it wasn't all one thing. You know, they did hold for hold. They did brawling. They did weapons. They did trying to get each other in submissions. And they had one sequence at about 20 minutes in the match where they're each getting two counts. You know, roll up, two count, roll up, two count, roll up, two count, roll up, two count. And it keeps going and going and going and going. And you just, oh, That is why I watch pro wrestling. The story they told could not be told in any other format. The way they wrestled, the way they used different styles to keep you hooked. This match was an hour and 10 minutes long. And Mm -hmm. I was not Mm -hmm. bored. I did not think, oh, will this ever end? The whole time I was on the edge of my seat. It was so well done. 
it's like when I read a really good superhero comic or when I watch a really good action movie or when I see a really good mystery where it just sucks you in and you forget. You forget that wrestling is fixed. You forget that there's a clock. You forget that this is a pay-per-view and they have to go off the air at a specific time. You just buy in. And I'm older and more cynical and I've seen more. So anytime anybody is able to, in any form of entertainment, suck me in and make me forget the rest of the outside world, that's what I'm looking for. And that's what I got last night. The best Iron Man match I've ever seen. And it may be the best wrestling match I've seen since CM Punk versus John Cena at Money in the Bank back in the summer of punk. Absolutely loved it. Can't wait to watch it again. Believe it or not, kids, you've listened to us blather on about funny books for two and a half hours. I am exhausted. Joe's voice is probably gone. But as we say every week, the comic we like the least, we still like better than the comic that you like the most. Joe? Joe? I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just so excited. I got all these books to read. I'm just starting. I started to read a book about anti-gravity. It's impossible to put down. I just read a book about Teflon, but it contains no frictional characters. The book about Mount Everest had quite the cliffhanger. Oh, sorry, Corey. I can't hang out this weekend. My, I'm fully booked. You've never read Fitzgerald? You can't be kidding me.